Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning if you're in the West. Uh, thank you for joining us today at the launch of the report of the Young Women and Non-Binary People's Experience of Gender-Based Violence Across Australia. I'll just give people a few moments to join and settle in. Um, my name is Karen Bentley. I'm the, I'll be your host today for this 90-minute uh, webcast. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of WESNET, the Women's Services Network, and I'm also the former Contract Manager for the Australian Women Against Violence Alliance, a waiver. Over the next hour and a half, we're going to be discussing violence and abuse, and this may include statistics and personal accounts around topics such as sexual assault, domestic violence, emotional abuse, physical violence and identity-based discrimination and harassment. And so this content may be difficult, so please take care um, and try to use uh, your own support or support mechanisms that you've got around you. But uh, just in case you need a little bit of extra help, we do have a wellbeing support officer on hand, Tess Moody, um, has uh, volunteered to be our um, wellbeing support officer today. And you can speak to Tess by clicking on the link below that will take you through to the wellbeing and support breakout room, which is another um, link, and you can talk to Tess on Zoom. So in terms of today's presentation, very big welcome from us to you. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'll shortly um, be handing over, um, but uh, what we will be doing today is, um, is going through some of the findings and then having a panel discussion. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. So before we start official proceedings today, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land where I live and work which is the land of the Zhajarung and the Jara peoples here in central Victoria. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and to any other First Nations people joining us for this event today. Um, today I pay our respects to the leaders and elders uh, past, present and emerging for all the lands that we are uh, joining this webinar from today because they hold the memories, the tradition, the culture and the hopes of all of the people and all the communities joining us today. I express my gratitude in sharing of this land and all of the lands, my sorrow for the personal, spiritual and cultural costs of that sharing um, and the hope that we may walk forward together in harmony and in the spirit of healing. In the context of settler colonial Australia and the ongoing genocide, a waiver acknowledges the specific forms of gender-based violence First Nations women and non-binary people ex continue to experience fueled by colonial concepts of race and gender. And we stand in solidarity with our colleagues at Natsiwa and all other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and non-binary advocates leading primary prevention and transformative justice efforts. There is no gender justice without First Nations justice. Thank you. If I can have the next slide. I'd also like to acknowledge the experiences of all the young victim survivors of gender-based violence who trusted a waiver by sharing their story as part of this project. I should mention too that this project represents the final piece of work undertaken by a waiver as a federally funded National Women's Alliance. The project, which was far from complete when our funding ended, um, has been supported to its completion by significant in-kind and paid contributions from WIDA and Natsiwa and my own organisation, WESNET. These organisations, along with dozens of women's specialist services, intend to keep the legacy of a waiver alive by maintaining it as an unfunded alliance. We believe that the work is too important and the need too critical not to undertake every possible opportunity to work collaboratively and constructively to end violence and end gender-based violence. And this project really highlights that need. As many of you would no doubt be aware, the primary source of data regarding individuals' experience of violence and abuse in Australia is the ABS, Personal Safety Survey. And while useful as a crude aggregate measure, it provides very little granular data based on forms of violence or women's experiencing negotiating systems or pursuing justice. 
The Women's Safety Statement promised to do more in terms of collecting data from women's specialist services, such as refuges and shelters, but we don't have that data yet. And we're, no, and we're waiting to hear how that will actually be, be happening. ANROs, academic institutes such as the Monash Gender and Family Violence Prevention Centre and peak bodies such as WESNET have been successful in filling some of those gaps while we wait for the data collections to happen. Back in 2020, a waiver recognised a significant gap in data relating specifically to young people and more specifically in relation to young people most likely to be marginalised or made vulnerable by unresponsive structures and systems. Existing data, even if not Australian data, made clear that young women and non-binary people suffered a higher prevalence of violence. And we wanted to know more. And we wanted to know about young people's and intersecting forms of experiences relating to race, culture, sexual and gender identity, ability and socioeconomic characteristics. And this project has delivered that. The pool of survey respondents who answered the survey is one of the most diverse range of young women and non-binary people ever likely to have seen, been surveyed at once across Australia. The forum, which was held after the survey to build on our aggregate data by adding depth and understanding, provided another opportunity to listen to and amplify the voices that too often go unheard. The findings, while incredibly valuable from a public policy point of view, are also incredibly painful, and we acknowledge that. We are presenting and discussing the findings today to inform, clarify and advocate. We need to acknowledge that violence and abuse against young women and non-binary people is not an individual issue alone. It, it has terrible and painful implication for each and every individual, but it is a social issue that is impacting most a and it's impacting a significant majority of young people. We need to understand that no one measure or approach will improve systems and structures for all women, young women or non-binary people. What improves access to justice for one young person may put up a barrier for another. So embedding inc inclusivity and intersectionality is essential to good policy making and service delivery. And we need to keep working together. We need strong national leadership on the issue of violence against women. And we need to keep pushing for better evidence, better evidence to inform answers and more and better targeted funding to the right places. We're sure to be discussing some of these issues in the panel questions and answer session a bit later on. Shortly, I'll be passing to Sandra Creamer to speak about the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Women Alliance involvement in last year's forum. And Natsi was current work with young women and non-binary people. Following uh, Sandra, Heidi LaPaglia from Women with Disabilities will present the key findings of the report. Um, and then after a short five minute break, we will then move to a panel and question and answer panel. So I would now like to introduce uh, uh, Sandra Kramer to speak uh, about Natsuwa's involvement in last year's forum. Um, Natsuwa was a key project partner on this report. And it's my uh, very great pleasure to introduce Professor Sandra Creamer AM. Uh, Sandra Creamer is a, a Wani Kalkudun Indigenous woman, and she's the CEO of Natsiwa, um, as well as a lawyer and adjunct profess professor in public health at the University of Queensland. She was awarded a member of the Order of Australia for her sub significant work on Indigenous women and peoples. Sandra advocates on human rights for Indigenous women and peoples both in Australia and internationally and she currently co-chairs the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Council which will be informing the next national plan to end fam uh, domestic family and sexual violence in Australia and will also support the implementation of the Closing the Gap Target 13. Um, a long-time member of the Waivers Advisory Group, her wisdom and counsel speaking for First Nations women about First Nations women and issues has been very important to the learnings of a waiver. My, uh, over to you. Thank you, Sandra Kramer. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, first of all, it's a real honour to be here and to be in partnership with a waiver and WIDA for all the work that you have done for, for women in this country, and that includes Indigenous women, all young women. But I'd like, and it's a very honour to be here. So greetings to you all. As you know, my name is Sandra Creamer, and I'd like to acknowledge the land that I'm on today. I'm on Durrumbul country, 
and I'm a one year Kalkadoon, but my skin name is Quiedo. I'm also, and Karen has raised what I do and where, where I am in my work, and I really enjoy doing that. And first of all, I'd also like to thank Natsiwa for always partnering with Anna Waver and Widow for partnering in this, but also for Waver for continuing to be that voice when they were defunded. I really respect the work that you have done and we have partnered over so many years. I've been here for four years and we've always partnered together and your, your um, submissions, your projects and doing this report, it's really a pleasure and honour to be on. We're very privileged to be working with you. I'd like to acknowledge my elders past and present for their strength, resilience and knowledge in paving the way for where I am today. It was them who stood tall and brave with brave hearts and strong spirits to make changes for our rights and gave voice to our culture and language. I'd like to also acknowledge that is Ochre Week, Ribbon Week for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and I'd like to acknowledge all the women who have suffered or know someone who have suffered uh, and ha or have been affected by domestic violence, sexual violence, family violence, all of that sort of behaviour. We are here with you to raise your voice because women can no longer be voiceless. I'd like to acknowledge the work that uh, the Indigenous women that have helped me with this, Michaela French from uh, Maua Law and also Louise Wellington, who is from the Central Desert area, who will be speaking today. They have provided the voices for young women to the, and contribute with me and have come on and taken the time. And I really appreciate that. I know Michaela spoke about how, she, how it was within the legal system for her as a young Indigenous lawyer and how it was and, and how she was the only young lawyer sitting in a room representing a case with all older white men and how she felt and that's how it is for a lot of our young lawyers who go in today in the legal system and that's how that shows the barriers that are still there within the justice system and also Louise thank you so much truly from my heart for you coming on today and speaking about domestic violence and other issues that are happening out in, in, the, in Alice Springs. I know after speaking with you today you know how strong your spirit is and really I am always very honoured to be working with you and we have always done so many things together Louise and you know you always come in and back up any of my work and that's the importance of having young people. We need to bring in young people. I'm a grandmother now. I don't know everything what young people want. I don't know their issues, I don't know some of the things that are happening but it is the voices of young women that we have to keep bringing in and, and telling us their issues and that's why it's, it's so important. For Natsu, we we'll do that. We have quite a few young women on our board now, which is really great, um, and who are business owners, disability, who are out there getting educated, but who are all grassroots women. And, and it's their support that has enabled me to continue to work with a waiver. And, and, and that's where we really are trying to bring in young leadership because we need to be able to have our young women talking as well on, in, at the table with us. It just can't be a, all of us elders or the same old, same old. So, you know, bringing in these young women that we have as leaders on that, so it's been a real privilege to, to work with them in different areas as well. But I'd also like to talk about the work that we do, you know, in Natswear and helping young women. And we do have a lot of young women who come on to our business programs that we do when we go out to Alice Springs and in Canberra and everything. And it's helping them also become economic people in their own communities. A lot of them don't want to go on the doll or a lot of them don't want to be, be doing nothing, but they all have a talent within themselves. So when we do our West, Westpac work with them, it helps them bring through their talents, but it also gives them the right information on how to be young business women or how to be leaders in their communities. And, and that's why we've got to, you know, it's important for us to give guidance, but also for us to listen to you. So the importance of young women and their voices, you have different concerns. We need to understand them. That's why this report is so important. It's a report that is about young women. It's a report that can go out to everyone so that we can understand 
where you are coming from, know your issues and know how to advocate alongside of you because I cannot speak on your experience and issues. And that's why this survey and the, this report has been so important. And again, I'm very privileged that Natua have been, have been able to come on onto this. Because we know within ourselves that when we come to the justice system, and as Michaela, who was speaking for us for Natua on our, our last uh, webinar that we had last year, how she spoke about it, how it was in the courts, and she was a young lawyer, and how intimidated she felt, and about how that is for our young women when they go in, because we have, one way is not the only way anymore, and we have to get an understanding of all the different issues, there's different reliefs, different values in everybody, and we have to be in those, in the justice system to make sure that those laws that, you know, we can somehow break or we can, do make changes and I'm a firm believer of taking things to court because then that sets down a precedent for change so when people challenge something and I just want to raise something and I just thought of this now but I remember when I was studying law of a young girl who was 16 years of age who made the changes for Centrelink because she didn't she felt that she didn't she had a right to be on Centrelink and she did not have to go to grade 11 or 12 like they said because school wasn't fitting for her. So she took it all the way to the Supreme Court to make changes for all young people to get, um, to get, to get Centrelink benefits even if they hadn't finished grade 12. And that's the bravery that our young women are doing today. You know, how brave is it for a young 15-year-old to ta take that challenge up? But there are so many brave women out there, and I know within my own family, I have some beautiful young, all of my daughter-in-laws and my daughters are just the most beautiful women who stand with strong hearts and strong spirits and are so brave. And that's, that's why, for me, it's an honour to be here. And to read that report is very important. You look at the surveys that were done, you look at what the need is, and and how we, by doing all of that, it's about then us bringing in the balance to make that change and for society to start accepting the change because that's what's got to happen. We have to all work together as a collective and do this so that change is made because if you look at the system and who wrote the constitution, it was all, and I'm not being discriminative or anything when I say this, but it was all old white males who done that. We need to make that change because everybody, we are becoming such a multicultural world, but we all have different cultures. We have different beliefs and different values. And by doing this report, it speaks about that. It shows that. And this is why evidence is so important. This is why writing this report to me was so important because it heard the voices of young women around this country. And we need to have that as a collective, that all young women come together as a collective to try and make that change and to make society and to make, to make those who aren't aware more aware of the voices of the young women. And we need to have that. Why? Because it comes down to funding. We need to look at the different areas that are needing funding. We need to, to look at the different services and different resources that are needed. And that is, that's one thing that is missing and that is a big gap. And that's why one of the things that I'm on, on the national plan, plan, uh, a national plan is looking at the closing of the gap, writing that Pacific Indigenous plan that's part of the national plan for Indigenous people because it's under target 13 of closing of the gap. And to sit on that table, I can tell you I was very nervous. And I get nervous because I have been a victim of domestic violence and at times I get nervous. It doesn't matter my age, you know, we all go through things in life and sometimes it, we can still get a bit traumatised. But we all have to be strong and I want to tell all the young women out there, be strong. Be who you are. Be your own mind. Stand tall, stand strong because you have that strong spirit. And if you see somebody out there who isn't or who is not in that situation and that you don't know, you know, always give them a hug. Be there for somebody, even if we just listen to them 
if you see a young woman, I seen a young woman in a shop one day and, and she had two little children and she was struggling to pay her, her she put back the toothbrush and, and toothpaste and just a few other things and I said, hey, you know, it's okay, I'll pay for that. We have to help each other through our crisis because you know what, when I done that for her, she was so happy. That's what we have to do because that happiness can give strength to somebody. They're not going to go home and say, oh, well, you know what, this is how I live. I'm going to not have that. When we see each other, support each other. And I'd like to, again, thank a waiver, widow for this and supporting and that's for supporting the voices of young women in this country or young women, but especially Torres Strait Islander women, women of different cultures, beliefs and women at, at general as that, young women as that because it is you who are our future. And I have so much faith in the future because I know I have young women in my life, in Natsra, who are strong, who have a voice, and we must continue to advocate, as like this report, for those women who may be voiceless. So thank you very much. And also, last of all, I'd like to thank Marley. From the bottom of my heart, Marley, Thank you so much for just pushing this through, for getting us all together and keeping us all going during the times we've, we've been busy. But you've assured and you've been the backbone behind this report. And Marley, I know you're only a young girl and I fully support all the work that you do. So again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. Please read the report. It is very important. And like I said, it would be great to hear from any of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sandra. Um, I'm always inspired by listening to you and I thank you and Natsiwa for all of the work that you do um, all over this country to try and um, really get people to have much more understanding. So thank you. I know it's I know that you are incredibly busy and working on so many different levels all of the time and I really respect and thank you for all of the work that you are doing. Thank you very much. So um, I think it's probably also timely to just say thank you very much to some of the key people who helped on this report and, and, and Marley Hermans is, is definitely one who has uh, had the brainchild and had main carriage of this with the UAVA team um, back in 2020 along with Pam Ruckler. Uh, Kit Muirhead, Tina Dixon, Merendel Mer Andrew, who uh, was also around as well, and Sumi, who um, was uh, came in at the very last minute from uh, Singapore to join us to help us write this report. So thank you, a huge thank you to those women and all the other women who also donated their time and energy to be part of the forum. I'm going to hand over now to Heidi Lapalia um, to speak about some of the main findings and statistics from the report. Um, so Heidi Lapalia is a proud autistic feminist activist from Hobart, Tasmania and is the Director of Policy and Programs at WIDA. Heidi has worked at WIDA for a number of years, in which time she's worked on a number of different projects, including the coordination of the WIDA Youth Network. Heidi also represents WIDA on a number of advisory groups and has been a long-time member of the AWAVA advisory group, where she's provided many, many valuable insights. Among other issues, she's got strong issues in ensuring that the efforts to support the safety and reproductive rights of women and non-binary people are inclusive of all people with disability. Um, so Heidi, I'm just going to hand over to you to present some of the main findings. Thank you, Heidi. Yeah, um, thank you, Karen, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I'd first just like to acknowledge that I'm calling in from Muwanina country, um, the lands of the Muwanina and Palawa people in Nipaluna or Hobart, Tasmania. Um, I would also like to uh, pay respects to our elders past and present and extend that to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander listeners. Um, so as Karen mentioned, today I will be taking you through the report on behalf of a waiver, um, focusing on key elements and key findings. In doing so, I'll be focusing mainly on the survey results. Um, these results give some great high level insights. It's important to note that the report compromises two elements, the survey and the forum. Uh, the forum served to add depth to our understanding, particularly around people's experiences leading to informed views regarding policy and service improvements. Our panel later on will go into more detail, 
not just in relation to the survey and project design, but also with respect to the forum and particular cohorts of young women and non-binary people. Uh, so as an overview, I'll focus on the following five areas, and they are who participated in the survey, what forms of violence are young women and non-binary people experiencing, reporting, support and justice. Uh, so first of all, who responded to the survey? An early and primary objective of the project was for it to deliberately seek out young women and non-binary people from a variety of diverse backgrounds. And this was one of the basis for Witta and Natsiwa's involvement from the beginning. Um, we understood that many voices, such as those from First Nations and disabled women and non-binary people, tended to be significantly underrepresented in more traditional policy and research. And these were the voices that we also knew anecdotally had unique and multi-layered experiences of violence and of system responses to violence. The survey was open between April and June 2021 and was shared widely throughout our combined networks as uh, three organisations. In total, there was 301 responses to the survey uh, from people aged 15 to 32 years. 90.3% of these identified as women, 10.8% as non-binary and 3.5% as neither. The diversity data in terms of the often hard to reach young women and non-binary people becomes apparent when you look more closely at the breakdown. So, for example, 62% of respondents identified as LGBTIQA, 56% uh, said they were living with a psychosocial disability or mental illness, and 26.4% with a disability more broadly. 7.2% were Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, 20.4% lived in a rural or regional location, 5.2% were sex workers, 41.2% um, were undertaking some form of education, 17.6% were from a culturally or linguistically diverse background, and 18% were migrants or refugees. Uh, so what forms of violence are young women and non-binary people experiencing? We already know that the prevalence and forms of violence vary by age, and that young people experience violence differently to older cohorts. However, the previously existing data is often limited to women and not disaggregated by gender diversity or other identities. So for example, the ABS Personal Safety Survey tells us that women in the 18 to 24 year old age groups were the most likely to have experienced violence. In 2016, an estimated 12% of women aged 18 to 24 experienced violence in the 12 months prior to reporting, uh, prior to the survey, sorry. Um, according to ABS Crimes data, in 2017, young women aged 15 to 19 had the highest rates of reported sexual assault of any age group. Drawing on US data, over half of transgender and non-binary people have experienced some form of intimate partner violence, including acts involving coercive control and physical harm. But as I mentioned, data in Australia around this is limited. Uh, the survey, this survey, drilled down into more detail about particular forms of violence, as well as allowing for respondents to describe their abuse themselves. In terms of overall prevalence, 86.4% of respondents indicated they had experienced some form of violence or abuse. The most common forms experienced were emotional abuse, sexual abuse, verbal abuse and physical abuse. Uh, system fail failures were very apparent, with 131 young people saying they had suffered, they had suffered institutional betrayal. New and emerging forms of violence were also evident with 107 respondents reporting online and technology abuse. The life circumstances of young people and their peers also played a significant role um, with 28 people reporting re reproductive coercion, 
20 noting institutional violence, 19 reporting cultural or spiritual abuse, 17 said um, that they had experienced college or university hazing, and seven identified as experiencing dowry abuse. These findings give insight into the nature of intersectionality, where gender, sexuality, race, culture, disability, and economic and housing insecurity all play a role in how violence is experienced. Uh, reporting violence. Uh, so one of the questions in the survey was, who did you tell about your experiences of violence or abuse? And just under 80% of respondents who experienced violence said they had told someone about it. Most young people did not use formal reporting mechanisms, instead favouring to tell friends or family or a psychologist or counsellor. One in five people told no one at all. Why didn't... Uh, Another question was, why didn't you tell someone about your report or experience? Um, and the main reasons for not reporting were being embarrassed or ashamed, fearful of not being believed or being judged, or due to a lack of trust in the systems. Reasons also emerged that again reflect the distinct experiences resulting from culture and life circumstances. So for example, 13% did not report because their community did not have a good relationship with the policing or justice systems. Um, and we know that this can be common for First Nations and disabled young people. Uh, young people were also concerned about potential ramifications on employment, housing and their social circle, as well as facing barriers relating to location and lack of financial resources. Um, then another question was, how did you report the violence? And almost all people who reported, reported in person. Um, in addition, a third also reported by phone. More than one in ten reported by email, SMS, website, a website, or had a friend or support person to report for them. Um, what were the outcomes of reporting? Disappointingly, disappointingly, over two thirds of respondents who reported said that nothing happened and nothing changed. In contrast, only one third said that they were believed and validated and supported to achieve safety and to heal. One in five did agree that they had been given access to supports they otherwise would not have had. Um, and only a small number of respondents said that their perpetrator had been held to account or that there was resulting institutional change or that the perpetrator had apologised. Um, and so support experience was another area. Um, and one of the more surprising and quite worrying findings of the report was the number of respondents who did not seek or access support. While just over half of those who had experienced violence sought support, that means that almost half did not. Sources of support were wide ranging for those who did seek it. Uh, the most common sources were again, psychologists or counsellors or family and friends. Over three quarters of respondents who accessed support um, accessed these types of supports. Approximately one quarter of respondents accessed sexual assault services, medical professionals, women's domestic and family violence services and or phone counselling. And just 15% of respondents who sought support sought it from the police. Uh, so what types of supports do young women and non-binary people access? The types of support sought by young women and non-binary people was diverse, again providing insight into the diversity of respondents. There was one form of support, however, that two-thirds of respondents sought out, and that was programs to help, he help with healing, including counselling and trauma recovery. Roughly one-third accessed information and referral services and or medical or health-related support. Other support types included disability support adjustments, legal and advocacy services, housing and financial support, and visa and migration advice. 
What were the barriers that prevented young people from getting help or support? Given that almost half of respondents did not seek out support, this is a critical question. Um, the respondents to these questions um, had notably diverse responses, uh, even in comparison to other questions that elicited a very large range of responses as well. The most commonly held reasons, however, included a lack of trust in being believed or a lack of trust in the system and fear of not being taken seriously. Beyond these reasons, a lack of information and not knowing where to go or not understanding their experience as violence were cited frequently. Other commonly identified reasons include not being ready to talk, fear of being blamed or of being discriminated against, bad past experiences and insufficient financial resources. Um, and we have a quote on the screen from um, someone uh, who talked about barriers to present to accessing help. Uh, so what does justice look like for young people? Uh, the final area we wanted to touch upon was what does justice look like for young women and non-binary people? This is a question that is rarely asked and an area where victim survivors may feel least likely to be heard. Almost all of respondents envisaged justice as meaning safety, recognition and perpetrator accountability. In fact, all of the most supported descriptions related to perpetrator accountability. Young women and non-binary people clearly perceive a lack of accountability as being a major barrier to accessing justice. It is important to note a very significant reason underpinning underreporting was identified as a fear of perpetrator retaliation. Accountability must be pursued in tandem with safety. Uh, so this brings me to the end of the survey results presentation. Um, while I was very pleased to be able to highlight some key findings of the survey, there are a number of other data items contained in the report that I haven't had time to cover. The forum also explored many of the issues raised in the survey in greater detail and considered more broadly issues relating to prevention along with potential policy and service solutions. This is also reflected in the report. Um, so now I'll pass over to the panel and the Q&A session, which will no doubt go into many more of these issues. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much for going through that, Heidi. Um, and um, thank you also for, to WIDA uh, for the amazing amount of work that you did to help us make sure that this survey and um, the Young Women's Forum and Non-Binary People's Forum actually um, went off very, very well. Um, so we will now take a short five minute break uh, just to let people have a, a breather, uh, maybe take a breath, walk outside after we've had all of that data um, shown to us. Thank you, Heidi. Um, so if we could come back, please, at quarter to the hour, wherever you are, and we'll introduce our panellists. Um, if you've got questions for the panellists, and I can see a couple are coming in, please hit the speech bubble, ask the questions, because we will um, have some questions for the panellists, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So thank you again, Heidi. Short five minute break, see you back at quarter to the hour or quarter past if you're in one of the central states. Thank you. Welcome back everyone. I hope you were able to get a breath of fresh air or a tea break or something like that. So it's uh, my very great pleasure to introduce you to our panellist of young people to uh, take some questions and answer session today about this report. Uh, so I would like to introduce our panellists um, for today, um, if I can help, thank you. So our first panellist is Is Hay, uh, they, them pronouns, um, is a disabled, queer, trans and mad young person uh, residing on stolen Wurundjeri Woiwurrung land. They are a writer, speaker and lived experience worker in the youth, disability and LGBTQIA plus spaces and spend their time advocating for radical intersectional approaches and transformative justice. They fundamentally believe that there is nothing about us without us 
and ensuring disabled and queer voices are leading our own advocacy is the only way to, to um, achieve liberation. Welcome, Is. Our second panellist is Margarita Deloco, uh, is a young queer immigrant activist for women and people with disabilities. She's currently the Youth Development Worker for Women with Disabilities Australia and has worked with various organisations including Kinspace and Children and Young People with Disabilities CIDA in inclusivity, diversity and specifically through sharing her own experience and encouraging others to do so. She's currently studying Law and Human Rights at the Australian National University where she's working on various human rights projects. Welcome Margarita. Third, uh, Marley Hermans. Marley is a disabled organiser, writer and community worker living in Yanjin, Brisbane. Marley is a Wiradjuri and European woman deeply invested in disability justice and abolitionist work. Committed to challenging ableism and the many oppressive systems that, remain in, uh, that it remains embedded within. She is currently the Policy and Project Officer at Women with Disabilities Australia, working across the WIDA Lee Project and WIDA's National Women's Alliance work. Marley has got an undergraduate degree majoring in sociology from the Australian National Union and is a current postgraduate student studying social work through Charles Sturt University. She uh, has organising experience within grassroots community groups, feminist spaces and the union movement. Marley has previously worked in the gender-based violence prevention at AWAVA and provides consultancy work for organisations such as Our Watch and Carers Australia. Welcome Marley. And finally, our fourth panellist for today is Louise Wellington, a Walpuri and Larita woman from Central Australia and a mum to one and a small business owner of two Northern Territory based businesses. Tali Creatives Aboriginal Art and the director and co-founder of Tin Truck Consulting Proprietary Limited. Louise's work within the business consultancy focuses on local decision making and co-design, highlighting and sustaining Indigenous voices and lived experiences in the community. She says, it's important to me to feel a sense of purpose in my life that looks different for everyone and is defined by you and you only. It can also be an evolving thing and I'm enjoying pushing the boundaries of my beliefs about the world. I truly believe that everyone has something unique and valuable to impact the world around them and I wish for nothing more than for every person to have an equal and equitable opportunity to be able to express that in their lifetime. And prior, prior to uh, diving into entrepreneurship, she worked in leadership positions across diverse industries around Australia, including community housing, building and construction, the performing arts, visual arts and women's programs. She's got a wealth of experience uh, in First Nations and socially conscious settings across the country, as well as a representative and intern at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women held in New York. Uh, a few years ago. So welcome Louise, a stunning panel of uh, young, young people today. So just a reminder to our audience, if you've got a question for any of these amazing young people, please um, use the speech bottle to, to, um, to put uh, that question in and we'll save it up and, um, and present it to our panellists. So I might go to you first Marley, um, having been involved in this project from the very beginning, I was wondering if you could briefly describe some of the key principles that um, you used to design the project or uh, that a way we used to design the project that was and or ensured the inclusivity of young women and non-binary people. Thanks for having me, Cara. And, and uh, before I answer that, I would like to acknowledge the ancestors and the elders of the country that I'm currently living on. I am in Mianjin, otherwise known as Brisbane, on sovereign Yagara and Turrbal lands. So um, I think this project was only made possible because at the time myself and a few other young women were working at a waiver and I know that a lot of us are really thankful to a waiver for investing in capacity building for young women and gender diverse people within the violence prevention space. So we raised this with um, a lot of the waiver team and said that violence is affecting us in specific ways that we're not seeing in the work that a waiver is doing or that the sector is doing more broadly, we need to do something about it. Um, so we took a, a co-design approach to ensuring that the project was essentially led by young women and gender diverse people. So before we even drafted the survey, 
or before we proposed the community forum, we knew that we needed to talk to a lot of the young advocates and activists in this space who are speaking up but aren't necessarily being listened to by the mainstream sector. So we spoke to the National Union of Students Women's Officer at the time, Georgette Moed. Thanks, Georgette, for all your input in the project. Um, we also spoke to a lot of the activists over at the It's Not a Compliment campaign, which is um, a campaign against street har harassment. And we also spoke to some other young women and non-binary people who are working in the legal industry. And just being able to anecdotally collect some of the things that they were seeing, but we knew weren't reflected in the data, allowed us to actually specifically target the types of questions that we wanted in the survey. And in particular, I really want to acknowledge that the final section of the survey, which to me is the most important and is the most groundbreaking, is the section that asks young victim survivors, what does justice look like to you? Because that's a question that we don't ever get asked. And that question was included because of the young people that Aweva worked with in co-design who said that is the most important piece of evidence. That is the most important piece of data that we want to know. So I think co-design was a really important principle. Um, and another important principle was always maintaining a trauma-informed lens too. Um, so we didn't want to be extractive and taking the stories of young victim survivors um, without acknowledging, you know, the generosity and the pain that can come with sharing those stories. Um, so ensuring that throughout the entirety of the process, we were valuing young victim survivors' contributions. We were acknowledging um, the, ta the sheer task of often having to repeat these stories, especially because we know from the data so many young victim survivors were retelling their stories over and over again and not getting listened to. Um, so I think, yeah, those, those two big overarching themes of co-design and um, trauma-informed awareness were really integral to ensuring that the project was respectful and accountable to young people. Thanks, Marley. I think that gives probably a bit of an insight to some of the amazing sort of back work that happened even before we got to um, launching the survey. Thank you. So, Margarita, I might turn to you as WIDA's Youth Development Officer. Um, so what do you think are particular barriers to ensuring involvement of young people with a disability and, and how are these overcome? Um, thank you, Karen. Before I answer this question, I want to acknowledge that I'm calling in from stolen Ngunnawal and Ngambri country or so-called Canberra. So to answer the question, ultimately I think that many of the barriers to ensuring involvement of young people with disability are the barriers put in place by institutions and services because we as a community are often an afterthought. Things like accessibility, which are often not considered or even talked about mean that most young people often aren't even to get aren't even able to get through the door. It's often labeled as too hard, which to me just seems that uh, young disabled people are not seen as valuable enough to put in that effort to make spaces accessible. Young people with disabilities also face particular challenges due to the nature of being a young person and in the majority of cases we face systemic discrimination on a variety of levels. The report itself shows how many young women and non-binary people have intersecting experiences. We're a diverse group of young people who have multiple identities and many of which pose limitations to if we feel welcome or are welcome in certain spaces. All of this means that although we have an incredible wealth of experience, our involvement is either considered too difficult or not worth it or too much of an afterthought that then uh, it's impossible to even put anything in place for our involvement. Many services and institutions don't even have intersectional approaches to their youth projects, which also makes it harder considering, as I said before, the systemic discrimination that is faced on so many levels and makes it harder to access resources and involvement in general. There are a multitude of other ways in which young people with disability are excluded. I think I would be going on for too long if I had to uh, go through all of them. but. 
I think that many of these can baseline be overcome by establishing meaningful design processes, like Mali was talking about, occurred during this report, and also putting the needs of disabled youth at the forefront. It's about putting these perspectives first, being guided by young people, and also allowing our pre-existing beliefs to be challenged. Uh, if we don't allow ourselves to challenge the thoughts that we might thought were very accurate or challenge the thoughts that we might thought have been the right way, uh, then proper change can't happen. Thanks so much, Margarita. And I, I think it's so important, isn't it, to sort of just be able to challenge, well, get outside your own bubble. Um, but also by making sure that things are accessible to everybody first, then of course anybody sort of in the mainstream is going to not have any problem with that. So uh, great, great points. Thanks for those. Um, is I might come to you, to you as a as a worker and writer with lived experience, and thank you so much for sort of joining in that capacity today in the, uh, and working in the in disability and LGBTQ space. Was the massive distrust in institution that was evidenced in the findings in this survey consistent with your own experience? And, and I guess to follow on from that, you know, are there ways to make existing institutions more responsive or should we be t trying to look to completely new models? Yeah, it's speaking. Um, I think firstly, it's um, a real privilege to be calling in from the stolen land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. So I want to pay my respects to elders past and present and affirm that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, my short answer to the question is yes, that it is in line with my experiences, the distrust in institutions, and yes, we should be looking towards new models. But my longer answer is that when you are a person with marginalised lived experience and somebody who experiences violence, you cannot be any of those things separate of each other. And that makes you seem like really challenging to any institution that attempts to interact because we don't fit into just a single box. And I think of it as this analogy with paint where, you know, people um, are all, all our different identities are different colors, but I am not the rainbow. I am the brown that comes when you mix all of the colors together. And so I can't just interact with a service or an institution wanting support as a survivor. I can't just interact with something as a trans person, as a disabled person. I am all of these things at once. And so are like the entirety of like intersectional communities. And I think because of that, we have to recognize that the institutions themselves cause violence to happen. So it is both like violence is something that I experience as an individual, but it's also something I experience as like a victim of the system of the institution. And ultimately, like a lot of these institutions that have power, whether it's the legal system or um, anything like that are based on like the systemic kind of whether it's patriarchy, whether it's transphobia, etc. that led to my personal experience of violence. And so recognizing that the institutions lead to violence violence, I think believe for me shows that um, like the role of institutions is not to support us after violence because they are not very good at doing that, but instead to use the institutional power to attempt to stop it beforehand. Um, but in a second, I'm going to tell you why we should just throw away all the institutions anyway. But I think fundamentally the experiences of myself and people with shared lived experience is that we aren't allowed to trust ourselves or the society that we live in with things that we know to be true even language around violence is gatekept. We are gatekept from receiving support and often we have to choose whether we engage in support or report an experience um, or be affirmed in our identities. We don't get to have both. And so fundamentally, if we have to choose between getting support and being affirmed, that isn't a choice. We don't, that is not something that we can actually consent to either way. And so ultimately with that kind of picture I've painted of institutions and how we interact with them as multiply marginalized people, I think like ultimately I'm like a, a big fan of revolutions. Like I think the, the key thing here is like, this is not good enough. We need a massive overhaul. We should be completely dismantling these institutions, removing their power. But I recognise that in the meantime, while I don't have the power to do that dismantling, there are a few things that we need to be doing to make these dis 
like these institutions of which we don't trust for valid, very valid reasons, slightly more trustworthy. I think as um, Marley talked about, um, trauma-informed care is really important, but not just trauma-informed care in terms of like, I know what trauma is and I'm caring for you with that context, but also like, I can be a perpetrator of that trauma by existing within an institution and benefiting from your marginalization and benefiting from your bio, like the violence you experienced. I also think a removal of ego and the like roles of power within these institutions. So not being like interacting with a system and then being like, oh, we're helping this poor, poor victim who is trans and disabled, like that ego that exists so strongly in the systems of the role of the helper and the helpie needs to be completely overridden so that we can engage as full selves rather than at the whim of someone with an ego. I think furthermore, like we need to have these institutions filled with people with lived experience, um, but also making sure that they go through regular reviews and are changed by us. So not just being like, cool, we have a board that has three survivors on it. It's about completely like removing all of the people without lived experience and replacing them with survivors, with trans people, with people of color, with First Nations people, with disabled people, and then reviewing them and being like, hey, you have to change this right now. Don't care that it's inconvenient for your bureaucracy. Um, I also think that justice to me, and I'm sure we're going to touch on it a bit more as kind of in the end of the report, like justice is more than just a per perpetrator being confirmed as guilty by these institutions, like by our so-called justice system. And I think for me, justice is this kind of transformative systemic support for me as an individual, as one of many individuals who experience these sorts of things. And so recognizing the role that institutions can and shouldn't play in that support gives us like a really clear direction as to new models for responding to survivors who distrust the systems that put us there in the first place. So that was, yeah, the, my long way of saying yes, indeed. Thank you so much, Is, And I can see that you've thought about all of this and it, your, your life experience on it. Um, so the advocacy, and I think that we should look out for, for the revolution, uh, watch, watch is hay. Um, so thank you for that. And I also, you know, really just agree that, you know, we have to have the survivors voices, but we also need to be thinking about the diversity of every workforce, uh, every system that we've got. Um, we've got a long way to go in trying to sort of break down some of these uh, inequities that we've got on so many levels throughout all of our system and society. So my last question for individual panellists is for, to you, Louise, um, which is that, you know, there's been a consistent theme in the report about lack of perpetrator accountability. And the report raised sort of some possibilities around transformative justice. Um, it certainly came up very much in the, um, the Young People's Forum. Um, First Nations communities, particularly women, are leading the way in this type of work. And so I wanted to ask, what does transformative justice mean to you? And, and why is it particularly resonant for Indigenous women, girls and non-binary people? Thank you for the question. I'm uh, here from, um, in Alice Springs from Aranda Country. And um, I just want to acknowledge Sandra Kramer's support and mentorship over the years. It's really important when you're doing work like this that is, well, both um, essential for our community to participate in these conversations, um, but it's also triggering and, and difficult as well. So uh, we do really need to lean on our support systems and networks when, when we've got them and develop them. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge um, the, I guess, victims and survivors of of gendered violence um, that are that are here listening. And um, it's yeah, it is it is a really hard topic. Um, and I say you. Uh, transformative justice, yes, it's so important in our community. Um, I can only speak from my experience and what I see around me in my community. Um, First Nations women's experiences are diverse and different around the country. Um, so I'll, I'll speak about what I can see around me. We live in uh, tight-knit communities with extensive uh, extended family groups in a lot of situations, and that includes uh, complex kinship systems. 
So <clears throat> when we have perpetrators in our community that are inca incarcerated uh, and then released and bailed back to their community, we're constantly being re-traumatised by the same people. And <clears throat> this, is, this isn't everybody's experience, but a lot of the time it's people that we love. Um, it, it's sometimes our fathers, our brothers, our sons and people that we know in our community. And I'm really glad the report touched on what justice means to people because <clears throat> it's not necessarily punishment people want. They want changed behaviour. They want action. They want law reform. And they want support for, for victims, most importantly, I think, most importantly. <clears throat> Sorry, it's um, this isn't this is an emotional topic for me. Thank you, Louise. I can see that it's very, very close. But it's it's important, and it's important yeah. to be, to to be heard as well. Um. Yes, yeah, so I'd also want to touch on um, some of the barriers to reporting that our women are experiencing. A lot of women that are in the Northern Territory, in particular, live in remote communities. Some of these communities have zero police resources. Um, they have in the past and they don't now, or they just never have. Um, so police responses are, are minimal or non-existent, um, even though we still have one of the highest police rates per capita in Australia. So it's something's not adding up for, for remote women. Um, and access to services are also difficult in remote situations where there's no actual phone coverage. So, you know, amazing services like 1-800-RESPECT and, um, and just any kind of services you can access online aren't available. There's no 4G, there's no, there's no reception and, um, and in a lot of cases no women's shelters. So <laughs> where do you go? And I think it's a really hopeless situation. I, I, I do want to talk about I do want to talk about solutions. I don't want to focus on the problems. But when you're in a situation where <clears throat> uh, nothing's going to be done, it feels very hopeless. And it can be a really helpless situation. And you don't know how to help those people um, when, when the community isn't, <laughs> yeah, it isn't surrounding that victim to, to help them get the support. So yes, transformative justice, I think, it's already in built into our traditional law and culture. It's not a new concept for Aboriginal people. <clears throat> we already have it. So culturally, when somebody uh, breaks traditional law or does something wrong in the community, they are held accountable. And there's systems and laws in place to carry out uh, traditional justice. So if that, that looks different for different um, uh, First Nations groups. Um, but it is there and it, and it always has been. So I think it's also time to, to rely on our elders and access that um, traditional knowledge and culture. Thank you, Louise. And I, want, I think, you know, that there are probably some other spaces and places and groups and communities that could also potentially benefit from transformative justice approaches and we should yeah, sort of start to look at some of those as well. Um, so just to sort of do one sort of question very quickly to all of you and just, just your sort of thought bubble, and I realise um, this is a little bit cruel because I'm going to sort of put you on the spot now, but uh, I just sort of have two questions for all of you and just if you could just very briefly just maybe give us the key takeaway so that we've got some things that we want to sort of move forward on. The first question I'll just pose to you is, was there anything that particularly surprised you about the project or the report findings, or was it all pretty much as you sort of anticipated? So I might just go to you first, Is. Yeah, Is speaking. Um, the report itself didn't surprise me, but what surprised me is that it is very much the first of its kind. It is very much like radical and transformative, which is a little bit absurd to me given these are our experiences, um, but that makes it all the more important. Thanks, Is. Marley. Yeah, um, like is, I don't think a lot of the data surprised me because it reflected my experiences and the experiences of the other young people around me. Um, but there was in particular one statistic that I saw that 
I asked, why haven't I seen this before, despite the community um, always voicing this? And that was the group that was most likely to experience discrimination when interacting with the police um, was women and gender diverse people who are working in the sex industry and sex workers. And I think that that's something that's really important to highlight um, because yeah, we, we know a lot of sex workers are experiencing gender-based violence in their lives and there aren't mechanisms to allow people to continue work but also to stay safe and to heal as well. Mm, thanks, Mel. Louise, might jump to you. Yeah, I, I really loved the recommendations that came out of it and I'm really glad children were acknowledged as um, victims in their own right. Um, I think it, when we place children at the centre of every policy um, and, and law reform, I think uh, will go a long way when we can focus, when we, we can have those child-focused conversations. Um, and I'm, I'm just really glad the, the Young Women and Gender Diverse Report came, came up with that. Um, really happy to see it. The Margarita. Um, Margarita speaking. Like everyone else, I wasn't surprised at the statistics, the experiences or the stories that came from the report. Um, but I was almost glad and uh, thankful and it's partly surprised uh, that a lot of the things that are kind of happening day to day in these communities and that we experience day to day were actually put into words. Um, some of the, uh, I guess, things about thinking about staff that is not trained well enough, as Molly said before, trauma-informed care, uh, all of those things impact our day-to-day -day lives and we're finally put into words uh, as opposed to the overarching statistics that are kind of talked about more. Thank you. So the other, you know, to try and sort of move this forward and also to try and capture some of the way forward from this, my, my other question is, so the, the report does offer up so a range of possible policy and systems reforms and that was really very much the focus of that amazing one day forum with, with young, young people. Um, but what is each of yours key takeaway? What would be your one key takeaway? And I might just cycle through you in the same order again starting with you is. Yeah it's, it's hard to pick just one because I think it's very clearly all so important um, but I think something that I haven't seen recommended before is obviously connected to that kind of transformative justice um, approach and I think for me what that looks like is justice not being viewed as okay the perpetrator is acute like is guilty of the crime is in jail is whatever that not being the end of the line for what that justice is it being like a requirement for that entire system to reassess how it happened in the first place like i don't want my abuser to go to jail i want them to know why they shouldn't have done it and to deeply contribute to the system not allowing it to happen again so justice not just ending once that person is dealt with i think is what that looks like for me and is my key takeaway Mali? Yes, oh, such a similar takeaway. I think, again, the fact that the majority of young people who responded to the survey, their, you know, vision for the future was one that was rooted in transformative justice, I think speaks to the fact that, yeah, we, we have and need completely different ways of responding to violence. Um, I think another key takeaway, too, that is very relevant to service delivery is the fact that a lot of young people expressed that they experienced oppression and discrimination due to different parts of their identity but also that training wasn't enough so it's not enough just to have anti-racist training it's not enough to have disability inclusivity training if your workforce is still predominantly white middle class women for example which we know is the case within the mainstream um, family domestic violence and sexual assault services so i think a takeaway and touching on what is said before is the importance of lived experience workers and actually having a more diverse workforce so that if you're a first nations woman 
if you're a disabled woman, if you are a woman of colour or you don't speak English as your first language, you can go get support and access healing from somebody who fundamentally understands your experiences of violence. Louise, would you like to go next? Um, yeah, I, I, the key takeaway wasn't one particular thing. It was just the, the knowing that we can't focus on one thing. We deserve all of it. We deserve every recommendation and the focus to be on all of it. We, we can't just put all of our efforts into one thing because it all connects together um, to have the best outcome. So, and, and people deserve that. Victims deserve it, um, and the next generation deserves it. So yes, we, the government does need to get on board. Society needs to get on board, and and listen and follow through with the recommendations from people with lived experience and and the experts in the field. And Margarita, um, I can't agree more with what has already been said. And honestly, I think uh, for me, it's really that highlighting the intersectionality and as is said before, that people bring everything and all that they are uh, to these experiences and to institutions and to services and they can't really, we can't leave part of us at the door and just um, include the the parts that are the most easy for people to accept or the most uh, accepting at that time. And I think for me it was really that also with transformative justice it doesn't in, in, doesn't occur without that inclusion, without that intersectionality, without that representation. And really for me the key takeaway of the report was that we need to highlight and listen and uh, really prioritize sharing and including uh, these experiences of young women and non-binary people uh, at the beginning of everything. Thanks, Margarita. So um, that's, uh, we, we can now open up and take a few questions from our audience and we've got a few questions that have come through. So um, we'll probably have about five minutes of questions now. Please, if you haven't asked a question and you have one burning away in your mind, um, put those through. I don't think we're going to get through all the questions, but we will, if you put your email address and name, endeavour to um, send these on to the panel and try and get you a response if we don't get through to your question today. So I've got the first question and um, maybe somebody can just raise their hand if they would like to answer it, which is, how can organisations demonstrate that they are trustworthy and will take seriously the needs of young women and non-binary people? That's from Jade. I can jump in first. Thanks, um, yeah, so many things. I think um, a lot of the time organisations are so good at telling us all the things they're doing well and don't want to tell us all the things that they're doing wrong. Um, but I find that if an organisation is like, here's how we made a mistake in the past and here's what we've done to change it, here's what we've, you know, here was an issue, here's what we've done to, about it, makes me trust them because they are willing to hold themselves accountable. And so I think it is about organisations having to be vulnerable and lose their ego and publicly kind of declare this isn't good enough and here's what we're going to do about it or here's what we have done about it. Um, you tell us what more you need. And so I think it is that kind of, yeah, admitting of faults and the steps to move forward and making that really public. And then secondly, I think it is filling your organisations with the people who are going to be engaging with those organisations. I don't want to interact with a violence um, prevention service that has um, a, a white, old white man who is the person who I'm interacting with first, that's someone that doesn't know how to use my pronouns, somebody that doesn't recognise my disabled identity. I'm just not going to interact with that organisation if that's what it's going to be about. So it's about filling organisations with the people that want to use them and that should be able to use them so that I know I can like enter a space and be seen and I can trust that that is happening, I suppose. Thanks, Is. Um, I might move on to some other questions. Um, so um, Casey asks, um, what is the definition in the survey of institutional betrayal? 
Um, I'm happy to speak to this one. So I, um, I was involved in drafting and publishing the survey and though I can't remember the exact definition we used word for word, I think when we referred to institutional betrayal, what we were referring to are instances in which young victim survivors reached out to an institution, um, whether willingly or non-consensually, um, after experiencing gender-based violence. And for whatever reason, they were let down by that institution and they felt that they were re-traumatised. Um, so a classic example would be for young people attending university campuses who felt that they were betrayed by their universities when those universities chose not to pursue any form of justice. Um, another form of institutional betrayal looked like First Nations women and gender diverse people who responded to the survey and said, instead of having any type of support or healing when approaching the police, I was further re-traumatised, I was further discriminated against and further harm was perpetrated against me. So I think, yeah, institutional betrayal in the context of the survey and the broader project was a way to describe how these institutions are letting us down and are essentially re-traumatising us. And as we've discussed, are perpetrators of violence themselves in a lot of instances for a lot of, in particular, marginalised young people. Thanks, Molly. Um, Margarita, I might uh, throw this question to you, um, but others jump in as well. And it's from Maria who says, um, what measures have been taken or what measures are planned on being taken to gather more accurate and in-depth data on gender-based violence faced by people who are non-speaking or who have really complex communications needs? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that this is actually um, a really good question in terms of also pointing out that a lot of the way that we gather data leaves out a significant group of people. As um, was said before, also, for example, uh, women and non-binary people in rural areas who don't have access to internet or things like that can't access the kind of surveys that we might be putting out. And I think that uh, the things that we're trying to put in place and the things that also uh, we're advocating for is uh, for individualized survey collection, uh, as well as uh, making sure that we essentially plan out these surveys to ask people what their accessibility needs are and how we can help best gather that data for them. So if this means um, sitting with them for a little bit and having a an experience individualized as opposed to filling out an online survey uh, or a multitude of other things as well. Thank you. And Marley, did you want to add something to that as well? Yeah, I just wanted to add to that as well. Um, so this is an ongoing barrier that we face in our work is how to reach um, young people in particularly segregated settings or institutionalised settings, including young people in care, young people in detention centres, young people living in disability group homes. And um, there's not an easy solution or answer. And I think that that goes to show that young people who are institutionalised and incarcerated, their voices are deliberately kept from us because these young people often experience the most grievous forms of violence. Um, but one thing that we were particularly happy to be able to do as part of the survey was produce an easy English um, translation and version. Um, so we'd have provided the funding to a waiver to produce that easy English translation. And I think that that um, was pretty groundbreaking because a waiver is not a disability specific organisation and often throughout the broader women's sector, the only organisations that do produce easy English content are disability specific organisations. Um, so I think looking towards accessible formats of collecting data um, that include easy English as well as translations in English um, and languages other than English, which unfortunately isn't something we had capacity to do with this survey. Um, but I think, yeah, that, that is one way to be reaching people with different access needs. Thanks very much, Marley. And we've got a couple of questions from, um, from, from Heather and Tina about um, getting into and digging 
uh, disaggregating some of the data um, and what our plans are for that. We do have the data. The data in this survey is an amazing mine for us to, to use. So if you are interested, we are very happy to collaborate with people about um, providing um, maybe some disaggregated data on that. That's all that we've got time for in terms of questions and answers today. I want to thank all of our panellists. I'm sure all of the people at uh, wherever they are viewing this are, um, are standing up and applauding. Thank you very much for all of your um, time today and sharing these sometimes incredibly personal experiences as well. I feel that we have um, a, a brand new sort of a brand new plan. Uh, panel here of young voices that we really need to be listening to in terms of the very imminent um, sort of next national plan to um, end gender-based violence. And I say gender-based violence um, advisedly because I think we do need to broaden this discussion to all the forms of gender-based violence that are being experienced by um, all ages of Australians. So I hope with everyone else um, you uh, have got something out of today's um, launch and the report, please read it. Um, the report is now available on the website and the uh, easy accessible version will be available shortly. We would love to hear your feedback, um, so please click on the I icon down below of your screen and, and click on the feedback survey to let us know how we've gone. Um, have we met your needs and have we done your accessibility, taking a leaf out of Is's book here. Um, and I just thought I'd just give a plug for a couple of other things. Um, WIDA's leadership statement on International Women's Day will be launching, um, so please look out for that and um, sign up for that. It's a new statement that's been co-designed by women um, and non-binary people with a disability. So um, the launch will be talking about how the statement was developed and how it encompasses WIDA's vision for transforming society's understanding definitions and presentations of what leadership means. Um, and a link to that event will be provided in the links below, hopefully. Um, and if, you're, if you aren't already, I strongly urge you to become a friend and supporter of AWAVA. You can sign up for friend and supporter membership on the AWAVA website. Um, and you can also sign up there for our fortnightly roundup where we just write and tell and share everything that we know that's going on to end gender-based violence. So thank you again to all our panellists and speakers today. Um, that, that's it. Thank you and goodbye.